again. Welcome to Lockdown and Beyond number six. Not the very original name change there. Did you see what I did? Clever, huh? Today, we will be continuing to mine out the gemstones of Romans 8. Jesus' good news in the midst of bad news. So far, we've unpacked loads, justification, sanctification, the wonder of our God, the Holy Spirit, the God of power, prophecy, presence, purity. Last time we looked at the evidence for the resurrection, the date of the facts. And today we're going deeper into why Jesus' resurrection is so crucial to all we believe. In the 18th century, Gilbert West vowed to write a book which would list all the contradictions in the Gospels about the resurrection and pluck the heart out of Christianity once and for all. In 1747, he published his masterpiece, which earned him an honorary doctorate from Oxford University. But the book he eventually published wasn't the one he set out to write. After diligently sifting through the facts, he was forced to argue in his conclusion that only through the resurrection were the first preachers of the gospel, weak, ignorant and contemptible as they were, furnished with strength sufficient to overthrow the superstitious prejudices and vices of mankind. After the American Civil War in the 19th century, a retired Union general, Lew Wallace, like Gilbert West, decided to write a novel set in New Testament times explaining why the resurrection wasn't true. But surprisingly, the more he studied the Gospels and the ancient evidence, the more he found himself convinced of Jesus' victory. When he eventually published Ben-Hur, A Tale of Christ in 1880, he told his readers, long before I was through my book, I became a believer in God and Christ. It was the resurrection that clinched the deal for him. An English businessman, Frank Morrison, tried to do the same in 1930 when he wrote the book, Who Moved the Stone? But once again, after considering all the evidence, he said it affected a revolution in my thought. The conviction grew that a drama of those unforgettable weeks of human history was stranger and deeper than it seemed. The irresistible logic of their meaning came into view. That was the 20th century. And now in the 21st century, the resurrection is still the pinnacle of Christian faith. As New York pastor Tim Keller writes, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. Jesus died, Jesus rose again, and many people witnessed his resurrected body. Fact. But this is not just a factual argument. It's not just an academic debate. If Jesus rose from the dead, everything changes. Romans 8.11 says, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. In another letter from Paul, this very same Apostle Paul opens this wider. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And we are then found to be false witnesses about God. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep, died in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And in Christ, all will be made alive. Resurrection, friends, is a big deal. Let me give you two reasons. 
Firstly, as we've partly touched on in lockdowns two and three, if Christ has not been raised, you are still in your sins. A statement like that will have caused uproar in the first century. As believing Christians, we have become too familiar, I think, with sin and wrath and forgiveness and atonement. In our comfortable lives, we haven't had to grapple with this like the early church. However, the doctrine of sin is crucial to Christian thinking and outworking. This is key to what Jesus described as the kingdom of God, transforming the kingdom of darkness. It's not just kind actions that makes a difference, but the declaration that sin is intolerable by God cuts us off from life with God and causes a downward spiral of decay and degeneracy that leads to ultimate death and separation, life without God forever. People don't like that message, I know, but it is good news because God has always had a plan. As Tom Wright, former Bishop of Durham wrote, Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project, not to snatch people away from the earth to heaven, but to colonize earth, colonize earth with the life of heaven. That after all is what the Lord's prayer is about, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So what's so unpalatable about sin? Probably the biggest issue is its inclusivity. What the Bible scholars call the total depravity of man. Every person born into the world is enslaved to the service of sin as a result of their fallen nature. And apart from the grace of God, every person is utterly unable to choose to follow God. Refrain from evil or accept the gift of salvation as it is offered. Total depravity, pervasive depravity, radical corruption, all terms for the same thing. No one is left out, the great lever of, leveler of mankind, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Francis Schaeffer, a philosopher and Bible teacher, once did a little thought experiment getting us to think about sin. And he says something like, imagine God puts puts a little invisible digital recorder around everybody's neck. And the only thing that that digital recorder ever picks up is when you tell somebody else how they ought to be or should be living. Sound familiar? So only when you start to say things like, you ought to behave like this or you should never do that or I can't believe that's what you said. Suddenly, click, click, the digital recorder starts recording. In other words, it only records your standards for behaviour, your standards for other people's lives, not God's, just yours. And then as you roll on through your life with this recorder uh, round your neck, click, click, clicking away, you eventually come to the great judgment day when, all, uh, when, when, when we're all standing before the throne of Jesus. This is a, just a thought experiment, by the way. And Jesus says on this great day, do you know what? I'm going to be really fair. You have no idea how fair I'm going to be. This is the deal. I'm not going to judge you by my standards. I'm not going to judge you by the, the golden rules or the Ten Commandments even or the law of God or the Bible or the example of my perfect life. No, no, I'm, I'm just going to judge you by your own standards. That's fair, isn't it? And so Jesus comes up to you and he takes that little recorder off your head and you say, gosh, I didn't realise that was there. And uh, he says, no, silly, it was invisible. I told you that at the beginning. Anyhow, it's just a thought experiment, remember. Anyhow, he takes it off and then he says, why don't we just play it back and listen to what you said and see if you lived up to your own standards. And so he plays it back. And we listen, and listen, and listen again. How do you think you would do, you would feel? Be honest. The reality would be this. Even if that's how God did his final judgment, based only on your own standards, there's not a person on the face of the earth who would stand and pass that judgment day. You know that, 
I know that. Our sin goes very, very deep and is often suppressed by a defensiveness and blindness and self-centeredness. But that's only one dimension of God's perspective on sin. It's actually much um, more than just doing wrong. You see, the Bible tells us that sin is an innate rebellion towards God. It, it's disobeying, disregarding, dishonouring God. A heart that doesn't make him central to all we do. Jesus said, it's what comes out of a person that pollutes obscenities, lusts, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, depravity, deceptive dealings, mean looks, slander, arrogance, foolishness. All these, all these are vomit from the heart. A heart that is in rebellion to, and hostile towards God. Soren Kierkegaard writes, human beings were made not only to believe in God in some general way, but to love him supremely, centre their lives on him above anything else and build their very identities on him. Anything other than this is sin. And this goes way, way back to the Garden of Eden, of course, when life with God changed. As Adam and Eve decided that they wanted more than just God, as they lapped up the lies of Satan, the life-giving God alliance, dependence, interconnection was severed. They got what they wanted. And humanity has never been the same, really. The Apostle Paul phrases it like this in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Now, we live in a world that finds this so unfair. I guess this is yet another dimension of the doctrine of sin. Its posh name is the doctrine of original sin, first shaped theologically by Augustine in the fourth century. We are so it's all about me and individualistic that this statement about how we are all in Adam and therefore die as a consequence of his behaviour sounds bizarre. Like Joy, one of my sons getting grounded for another son, just smashing the windows. It's not fair. But the Apostle Paul's, God's, Jesus' understanding of the human race and sin is altogether different. It's much bigger, much more complex, more holistic than our smaller eyes can see. God is bigger than that. He sees his all creation, generations of humanity is connected, interdependent, reliant, a beautiful totality. After all, this is what, how he has created humankind. And so in his creative understanding, what happens to one does affect us all. Probably the best analogy I've heard to describe this is from a Bible teacher called Andrew Wilson at King's Church, London. He says, imagine if I was suddenly stabbed in the heart. It would make no difference whatsoever to the well-being or health of my next door neighbour next door. However, if it would make an enormous difference to the well-being of my kidneys and my brain and my left eye. Within a few minutes of me being stabbed in the chest, my kidneys would stop filtering. My blood, uh, stop filtering my blood. My brain would stop processing information and my left eye would stop seeing. Now, when the paramedics came flying in and land at the scene, it would be totally stupid for them to start to start saying stuff like, that's not fair. His left eye didn't get stabbed. It wasn't his kidney's fault. What did his brain do to deserve that? Daft questions, daft thinking. Why? Because human beings are an organic whole, aren't they? My left eye didn't die because it did something wrong. It died because it was inseparably connected to the rest of me. That's why racism affects all of us. That's why injustice to the poor and marginalised affects us all. That's why famine in Africa, persecution in North Korea, religious unrest in India, melting ice caps in the Antarctica and deforestation in South America affects us all. The Bible is crystal clear about this. What happens to one member of my whole body happens to all the others. That's how we were created. What happened to Adam also happened to us. But, but, 
Jesus says, but just imagine the paramedic did come and get me to James Cook Hospital and put the paddles on my heart and boom, it starts pumping again. Well, then my kidneys would start filtering again, wouldn't they? My brain would start processing again and my left eye would start seeing again. Woohoo! Jubilee, that's where you and I stand in connection with Jesus. For it isn't Adam, all die, so in Jesus Christ, you and me will all be made alive. He is the first fruits, the early crop of the harvest that shows us surely, certainly, definitely a huge crop is on the way. Why? Because in Jesus, it is finished. Sin has been conquered. Satan's head has been crushed. Jesus took it all on the cross and we are hidden in him and his victory, his sacrifice is ours. Not in Adam anymore, but now gloriously, securely, lovingly, eternally in Christ. And his resurrection, friends, is proof that God accepted the sacrifice. It's finished. It's over. C.S. Lewis writes, if we let him he will make the feeblest and filthy of us, filthiest of us into a dazzling, radiant, immort, immortal, pulsating creature with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot imagine a bright, stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly, though on a uh, smaller um, scale, of course, his own boundless power and delight and goodness. That's what we are in for, nothing less. 1 Peter 1, 3 says, In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. On the cross, Jesus conquered sin and the resurrection proves it. But secondly, Jesus also conquered death. When we get into the shoes of those who lived out that very first Sunday after crucifixion, when Jesus rose from the dead, things are not necessarily as they seem. Sunday changed everything for sure. But when we celebrate Easter, we have a big rah, rah, shout. Spring is coming. Flowers are blooming. Life is eternal. Everything is going to work out. Yippee! So let's clap and dance with joy and jump up and down like we just don't care. But that's not how it really was on that first Sunday. The first response to the resurrection was actually fear. In fact, Jesus had to console his followers afterwards. He had to explain the reality of the resurrection over the years, especially in the Western world. This has got a little lost in translation, I think. What does Jesus actually say to his followers after he rose again? Well, he says, look, there's work to be done. They haven't stopped my plan, you know. In fact, it's going to go on and on, bigger than you ever thought. Matter of fact, my plan to love your enemies, to be willing to sacrifice, suffer and even die for the sake of love has been vindicated by God the Father through my resurrection. So listen, now everyone out there is going to be really ticked off. Pilate, the chief priests, have already plotted to squash this news. They're furious. They're desperate. This is the situation that I'm leaving you in now, friends. This is your resurrection life and purpose. So go, you women, you disciples. Tell them all that the cross failed, Caesar failed. Pilate failed. The chief priest failed. Now, by my spirit, they have you to contend with. But fear not. I've not left you as orphans. I've come to you. That's the meaning of resurrection. On Sunday, their lives didn't get safer. It got much more dangerous. What was released on Resurrection Sunday wasn't comfort, but a fearful reality of the centrality of death. Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. 
Whoever serves me must, must follow in my footsteps. Jubilee, listen, this will help us reorient our lives around the resurrection. The hope of resurrection wasn't that life would turn out well, but rather it was a hope of the future that called people to die now. To die to selfishness and sin and fear and greed. Die to a lesser self so that a greater self might be born. And what is so phenomenal about this countercultural message is that many people heard and did exactly what was on the tin. They lived differently. They saw things differently. They suffered. They were prepared to lose out and sometimes die. In this new resurrection community, the church, the God who had created life was beginning to recreate upside down. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last supper, at the last trumpet, the dead will be raised imperishable. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Where or death is your victory? Where or death is your sting? Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Jesus has conquered death. I first met Paul Cummins at um, the Rusty Bike Cafe in Swainby. He was an avid cyclist, but most of all, he was an avid declarer of the gospel. He loved Jesus. His joy in God was contagious. He was known for his outrageous laughter. What could make him so joyful was the question you could see on people's faces. Because on the face of it, he didn't have much. You would, you would see him chat to the visitors, the waiters, the waitresses. He would always come up over and chat with us, enthusing about the church and Jesus and the gospel. Despite his illnesses and frailty, he lived with an eternity in his spirit, a joy unshakable. And today, Paul is happier than he could ever dream of. He's got what he so preciously wanted most of all. I'll miss my friend Paul, but his sleep is over. He is now more awake than he could ever imagine. Revelation 21, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Hallelujah. In the resurrection of Jesus, we have the death of death. The birth of new life, the final showdown with sin. Jesus is our conqueror. As Andrew Wilson writes, resurrection is the victory prayer. As Jesus, the risen champion, comes out of his tomb fully alive to the amazement of earth and to the applause of heaven. And therefore, we go into the world serving all, knowing that in him, we are more than conquerors too. Charles Wesley writes, Christ the Lord is risen today. Sons and men and angels say, raise your joys and triumph high. Sing ye heavens and earth reply. See you at lockdown seven soon. Mm -hmm.